facts that stand alone do a lot better in the accuracy scale than facts whose meaning changes dramatically in context. Um, but the community of active users really does a lot for accuracy. There was a professor uh, in the US, Alex Halleweiss, and he decided to do a test entering errors in 13 very different kinds of sites. Uh, er errors of middling importance, um, and sometimes of minor importance on this site. Uh, and he discovered that all these errors, all these 13 errors, were corrected within three hours. Well, so the ability of Wikipedians to develop and know what a neutral point of view is is actually very impressive. Uh, there is a Wikipedia entry on conspiracy theories around 9-11. Conspiracy theories around 9-11 have been a very, very big deal in the United States. Um, it would take me 19 of these slides to show you the entire length of the entry on conspiracy theories around 9-11. And the research trail is thoroughly documented. The site meticulously disproves the conspiracy theories. Uh, without um, dismissing their importance to the people who believe that they are important. Uh, they, they do not enter into the question of the integrity or the motives of conspiracy theories. This, this is a record of a long discussion among people who think this is an important issue about what's true, and the conclusion is it wasn't a conspiracy. Well, so what's it's so exciting about Wikipedia isn't just the generation of new information. What's exciting is that you're looking at the creation of active publics around the creation of knowledge for publics. People who have those certain entries on their watch list are part of a public in which there can be vigorous disagreement, but shared commitment to addressing an issue. Wikipedia and blog actions take some explaining. And the problem is, how do you get reliability out of a mass of unreliable actions? Wikipedia is overwhelmingly uh, contributed to not by academics, not by experts. So why, why do you end up with authoritative entries? That is where you can turn to complexity theory, to emergent social networking theory, and to a notion that this uh, American author, James, I believe his name might be pronounced Sorovetsky. Who knows? Polish people here, yes? Sorovetsky. thank you. Okay. Um, he calls this the wisdom of crowds. And of course, it's a turnaround on the folly of crowds. Uh, he's an economics writer at the New Yorker. So he took a look at the uh, <laughs> academic literature on group decision making. And this book uh, it, it exposes the counterintuitive fact that groups can, in fact, be wise. Uh, group, groups of people who individually and without consultation, pool their opinions. Even though their expertise varies widely and includes real experts and people who know nothing. Uh, they seem to regularly come up with answers that are at least as good as that of the most accurate and knowledgeable person in the group. I don't know about you, but that really surprised me. Uh, it turns out that it's not all crowds or groups. Uh, to be a functioning wise group, this group needs to be truly diverse, and not in a politically correct sense, but in the sense of a great variety of knowledges and experiences. Uh, you need the ignoramus as a lot of the smart allies. They need to not be influenced by what they think somebody else uh, is going to say. Usually that means not knowing what that other person is going to say. They need to have ways to aggregate their knowledge. They need to be able to coordinate their actions based on it. There are groups that do not benefit from the wisdom of crowds, and there are groups that have a lot of the same kinds of knowledge, make the same kinds of assumptions, who already know what's best. Well, take that definition for a wise crowd, and then consider some of the tools being developed to allow people to uh, make their own media. <coughs> Find others to share it with, and aggregate material that interests them and participate in ranking this material according to a wide range of criteria. Well, gosh, that's a recipe for decentralized collaborative media. Okay. So shall we just sit back and relax and watch the creation of new public media? 
no need for subsidy, no problems. Well, there, there are people who have not been waiting for it to just uh, spontaneously generate. Uh, there have been some self-conscious attempts to create open source, open access, and specifically public mandate media using more traditional media roles such as editor and getting foundation grants to support the volunteer work that fuels the content. And I'd like to give you a few examples of those outside of the reign of the world of today's public broadcasting. One example is OneWorld.net. Uh, OneWorld.net is an international news organization that draws upon a network of over 2,000 organizations that share human rights values worldwide. It produces international news in 11 languages. It has 12 national production sites where editors gather news from many nonprofit partners and synthesize it both for a local audience and for a global audience. This is an example of a Canadian site. Uh, One World is not, however, just a news hub. It's also a site for action. More, more than <coughs> half of its readers reported in a 2004 poll being moved to action after reading One World News. So it's also a creator of public through the creative generation of information. OneWorld.net has also opened up a participatory online television site where viewers can watch grassroots video from, for, from more than 4,500 contributors. You can be the 4,501st. And learn more about a range of topics, including, for example, local community initiatives, which is the page that we have represented here. <coughs> It has even gotten itself an island in Second Life. And can I find out how many of the early adopters here have gone to Second Life? Oh, and you have an avatar, I can tell. My avatar is still wearing regular clothes, so you don't have to lie on. Second Life, for those of you who have not yet joined, is uh, a virtual platform entirely created with all of the content entirely created by its own members. Um, it's a video game that makes up itself, basically. It's a video world that makes up itself. The theme that One World has on, on Second Life is global warming. It's called OneClimate.net. Um, you can also see a video about Second Life on YouTube uh, by One World. Um, that site in, in Second Life is going to grow and change to the extent that members of One World's public participate in making it a vital start, uh, start site of exchange for themselves about what they are going to do about global warming. WITNESS, an international human rights organization that provides uh, training and support to local groups to use video in their human, uh, human rights advocacy campaigns. This is the organization that was started some time ago by Peter Gabriel, and it has grown and developed uh, with some really fantastically interesting trial and error experiments in what works and what doesn't work in video and human rights. So WITNESS gives human rights activists cameras and training and it also serves a number of other functions, including brokering information with mainstream media, with public officials, and with the wider public. So its goal is to help video become a tool for social change, online and in other places. One of its recent achievements uh, was that uh, a, land, uh, a peasant land rights group in the Philippines uh, was able to use video taken during an actual massacre to convict killers of the person who was murdered. Witnesses now has a new, what they call, video hub that allows people to upload material directly to its new site from their computers and cell phones to review and to rate others' work, to create groups and forums, to organize events, and to build campaigns to use this video. So once again, it's beyond information provision, and it's even beyond <coughs> triggering action. It's about creating communities of people to act. Another example, Global Voices. Global Voices is a meta blog. It's a blog of blogs uh, from around the world. And they're using a very simple blog platform. A very small group of editors worldwide sifts through blogs in their region. This is actually another interesting example of an interface between mainstream media and new online participatory sites. This uh, Global Voice is, is run by an uh, ex-CNN journalist uh, who's an American based in China. 
A global voice is his broken news from eyewitnesses whose voices may never have been heard without disaggregation. It is now a frontline news source whenever there's trouble in the world because there's bound to be a blogger somewhere there and they might have been able to capture some video on their cell phone. It has created publics concerned with poorly reported regions. One of its most hotly blogged areas is actually uh, uh, from Western Africa. <coughs> Dan Show. Dan Show is an open digital archive in the U.S. of more than 500 hours of audiovisual material on the Japanese internment during World War II. Filmmakers and their families have donated material into this open archive as a way to make sure that the history stays alive into the next generation. They are willing to face the, uh, the possibility that somebody will take their grandfather's interview and use it for purposes that they would regard as grossly inappropriate, knowing that they're knowing that they care more about having this material be available into the next generation and be an active part of living history. Right? So where have the public broadcasters been? Uh, are they opening up into this new open environment where publics are forming? Once again, I can only speak from a U.S. perspective. Uh, it has been hard. <coughs> among us. It has been very hard for public broadcasters even to recognize the power of this new environment. I think for many public broadcasters it is still very much uh, a cutting edge new phenomenon and I think many people are not terribly comfortable with it. Some of those people are still wondering if it's even real and of course this very fast changing open environment is not waiting for anybody to catch up. There have been some very interesting first steps in collaborating with the producers who used to be your audience. And so I'd like to share a few of those uh, examples from the U.S. Public broadcasters are blogging. And they are linking to bloggers. They are even basing news on blogging. Radio Open Source, which comes from PRI, one of our uh, many uh, public news organizations, public radio organizations. Radio Open Source harvests news from the blogosphere and then opens its program for suggestions from bloggers and then puts bloggers on air. Some of the most seasoned journalists in radio are now collaborating with bloggers to make this programming. And I encourage you to uh, go to Open Source and uh, connect to their podcast. Also, their uh, guide to bloggers is uh, is a really exam interesting example of setting standards for uh, good behavior and good etiquette in this emerging environment. At the Independent Television Service, which is the part of public television dedicated to supporting innovative programming for underserved audience, audiences, they're actually building a, a lab for interactive experiments. One of them is Electric Shadows, it's a set of web-based multimedia projects on themes such as young people in war and visionary art. It's also opening up a site to encourage young and new producers to work with content created by ITDS funded makers who will let them do that. It's basically ITDS funded makers who will uh, leave digital files on their website available for other people to do mashups with them. They were inspired as uh, I'm sure you're uh, linking up to uh, by Paul Gerhardt and the Creative Archives at the BBC. Similarly, at one of our largest public uh, TV and radio stations, WGBH in Boston, um, they've done, uh, undertaken another mini experiment, another based on the, uh, the Creative Archives at the BBC in providing open access and in what they call a sandbox. Uh, he has a set of 24 audiovisual files, which is a tiny amount, uh, clips that anybody can now use to incorporate into films that they make and can then post on these sites. These are open creation sites that are really tiny little experiments with very harsh limitations on distribution and use, but they are an attempt to, to provide a safe space to experiment in open source participatory media. At Minnesota Public Radio, which has really been a leader in making the audience a co-producer, they've developed a gigantic database of their own listeners, who are then become their sources, 
and then become effectively co-producers of the material. It's, uh, the, it started out as a mega Rolodex for their story research, and it has now really transformed how they develop the news. Public Radio Exchange. Um, Public Radio Exchange is a new open platform. You could upload uh, a radio show to this platform if you wanted. Um, it allows independent producers, whether they are professionals or not, to upload material that can be considered by public radio programmers for, uh, for their program. This is, uh, a, a this is a digital platform that has addressed a problem in our very diversified and almost feudalistic form of public broadcasting that we have in the United States of how would you ever even know about an independent production uh, if you had a slot on the air and wanted to, wanted to get it. This is where you'd go to find out. Uh, and it actually has a, a, a payment, a back end for payment so that simplifies the process of acquiring it as well. So you can pay for it, you can download it, you can use it all in, on one site. It's actually generated hundreds of new programs and hundreds of thousands of dollars of revenue for, uh, for makers that, that are now voices that never were, never had been in the system. It has not yet made any significant money for anybody, but a lot of the people who are uploading to public, public radio exchange are not primarily interested in the money, they're just dying for access to the system. StoryCorps. StoryCorps is a national project to instruct and inspire people, I quote it from their website, to record each other's stories in sound. So it has local equipment, little kiosks, um, that, if, that two people can go into this little uh, recording booth and interview each other and leave the record to be aired on public television and also archived and showcased on the web. So this project has dozens of partners. There are corporate partners and they're nonprofit partners. So businesses have a little kiosk uh, where their employees can, uh, can tell stories. Um, this is a project from the absolute margins of public broadcasting. It's from an independent. David Isaac uh, has an uh, outfit called Sound Portraits that does a lot of really astounding and creative work. And StoryCorps has become a very, very beloved part of national uh, radio now for us. So each one of the examples I've told you about is pretty much a doodle on the margins of, of US public broadcasting, actually. Um, it really took a long time for our public broadcasters to get used to websites. And um, that's now what we call Web 1.0. And the world we're now in is Web 2.0. And that, that is a, a, a web in which social networking has net media production. So um, probably the biggest challenge for our public broadcasters is, is one that's actually unique to our system, I think. And that's trying to figure out how to develop collegial relationships among their many tiny little outfits, all those stations, all those aggregators, uh, so that they can actually uh, have uh, benefit from a common digital platform and access to an open environment, because they, they do not operate in an open environment otherwise. I guess when you look at the tininess of these demonstrations from U.S. public broadcast, and you ask, ask, okay, well, if the world is going to this incredibly exciting Web 2.0 world of participatory media, and that will be a very important site for the creation of publics. Do we really need public broadcasting anymore? Maybe those neoliberals are right. Well, I would argue old-fashioned mass media are still very, very important in our world. Uh, I think Web 2.0 is also important, but I think that old-fashioned broadcasting, <coughs> mass media, are still the bowling ball into our subconscious. Uh, broadcasting continues to be the best way to reach all the people, the most people at one time that there is. And if you take a look at advertising rates for uh, broadcasting, they reflect that. I've been highlighting how quickly a new world is emerging. And that is well shown in the rapid growth of several new digital radio services. Internet radio, digital music devices, I'm sorry, new production is so bad here podcasting, satellite radio, and digital radio. Look at, look at those bars and look at how quickly they've grown. <coughs> but look at the bottom bar, that's radio. Uh, when you compare it to the current audience for radio, you can see that old-fashioned, one-to-many mass media continues to have a very powerful voice in society. 
Currently, public service broadcasters serve functions that are not even on the horizon yet in participatory media. And one is consistent, high-quality research in timely public affairs. In short, news. There is no Wikipedia for today's news. Much of the blogosphere hooks back to mainstream media. Collaborative practices have not yet supplanted timely professional reporting. Professional journalists continue to provide the analysis and framing that is critical to understanding. You saw the results of our midterm elections, and the midterm election results were uh, overwhelmingly overwhelm overwhelm reflected the fact that the United States public is really concerned about the geopolitical role of the U.S., especially in Iraq. There have been several recent books on the Iraq War that uh, grew out of mainstream media reporting. Fiasco and State of Denial were written by reporters from the Washington Post. Cobra II was written by two reporters from the New York Times. Hubris was written by a new Newsweek reporter and a reporter from the Nation. So blogging was not looked up in the context, the depths of analysis, the access to publishers, reviewers, and inside baseball readers that they have. So, basically, news reporting is a great role for public broadcasters, especially with their very high trust value. Uh, another critical role that experts in public media can play is as aggregators and facilitators. The creators of safety zones and, and zones of assurance in very messy in a very messy, noisy environment. This changes the role that broadca uh, broadcasters from purveyor to that of host uh, and from purveyor to that of facilitator. But that change is one that is really welcomed by listeners. Uh, for instance, of Radio Open Source or of uh, Radio 3. We had a wonderful meeting this afternoon with uh, people from Radio 3 who were telling us that the uh, musicians that they showcase on Radio 3 are have become basically people who help grow Radio 3. So the relationship that, that Radio 3 has with the musicians is extremely interactive. So it is podcasting and other pod, iPod and phone-friendly forms of reaching mobile publics become ubiquitous. The opportunity both to aggregate and to provide targeted information uh, for and aggregate information from micro publics will only grow. Another major asset is the deep archive that some public broadcasters hold. I wish that our public broadcasters uh, had a deep archive, but mostly they don't. Uh, I believe that your public broadcasters do, and certainly the BBC does. Uh, these can form a rich educational resource. These assets provide, among other things, a rich bank of resources to support the never-ending quest for national identity. The BBC's Creative Archive is a beginning attempt at making assets available for the public to use and to reuse. It's a very interesting project because it has run into huge obstacles dealing with rights acquisition. Uh, in pioneering that attempt, and those obstacles will continue to be there for some time to come. However, the opportunity remains there for uh, organizations that have developed a deep archive to be able to mine it for the future. Finally, as we know from the history of communication, there is no form of media that ever gets retired. <coughs> Somebody, in fact, today is inscribing on a stone tablet even as I speak. Participatory has a, media has a vital, vital inter intersection right now with mainstream media, and I don't think that's going to go away. Public broadcasters are also in a glorious position to seize new opportunities, because the possibilities of a public media in which the public shapes its own media are really breathtaking. They are also nascent. You can see the bare glimmering of a beginning. Public broadcasters could shape that future. They could bring out the best in mainstream media and build the best of public media in an open environment. How could public broadcasters leverage, leverage their assets and adapt to the environment depends on who they think they are. If they think that they are providers of media for public knowledge and action, then this is a truly thrilling, if terrifying, moment. They will be big begging their regulators for appropriations and remits that make them innovators and experimenters. They will be scrambling to find new partners. 
He will be generating new models for making news, public affairs, cultural programs that vitalize public. If, on the other hand, they think that they are the good guy broadcasters, then they are going to be worried about eroding market share and failing business models. Now, in reality, it's probably some of both. But, you know, ultimately, their identity is their problem. And they are the only people who can solve it for themselves. That is the curse and the blessing of incumbency. <coughs> so, how are you and I going to be able to promote public media for an open environment? Because that's where the future is. There are enormous opportunities here. There are also plenty of policy roadblocks on the way to a vigorous public sphere in an open media environment. I and many others, um, including Bob Hackett, have written extensively on these road, uh, roadblocks, which range widely. They include how we are going to allocate spectrum in the future, how commercial and non-commercial providers of internet access structure their networks technically, how we translate today's inequalities into an online environment. How we decide to safeguard the public from violation of privacy and fraud while maintaining equality of access. How we reward innovation or privilege in comments. One issue that we focused on in my Center for Social Media uh, is the problem of rights. Copyright terms have been extended to far beyond the life of the creator, and that has partially limited the pool of material that is easily available for future creators. Furthermore, big rights holders have bullied small, bullied small producers and scared school children, and their teachers. People have almost forgotten that users of copyrighted material have rights too, including what in Canada is called fair dealing and what in the United States is called fair use and that they need to insert, assert these rights in order to keep them. So at my center, we've been working on education and developing tools, one of which you have in your hands, I hope, the Statement of Best Practices, that allow people to more effectively assert their rights. I was enormously buoyed just before I came to discover that filmmakers in the Canadian Documentary Film Organization, DOC, are now taking up this issue as well. So there are plenty of places on the policy landscape to take action anywhere probably that you want to land, if you want to support public media in an open internet environment. And at Graham's Prime, we're here now. Well, <laughs> I hope you would be happy to take on these problems because of the promise of a public media that can fuel communication for public knowledge and action. I think he'd be urging municipal or national common carriage style broadband utilities. I think he would have the Wikipedia entry for Canadian identity on his watch list. I think he'd be convening folks to figure out how to have, how to have a national online meta blog on top of Canadian issues. I think he'd be urging Canadian public broadcasters to seize opportunities to take advantage of the chance not only to speak to the public, but to be the facilitator a publicly made public media. I think there's never been a better time to make public media. And I actually can't wait to find out what you're going to do with your opportunities. I hope that we can share that. I share that information on our future of public media blog at the Center for Social Media. There are people I'd like to thank, people who gave me slides and information for this presentation, Jake Shapiro, Tim Olson, and Sally Pfeiffer. And I'd also like to thank the Ford Foundation, which provided funds for me to explore the future of public media, my university, which let me come here, and the Green Scribe Annual Lecture on Public Broadcasting. And now I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. We'd like to uh, take this opportunity to open up the floor to questions. And uh, I'd like you to. Uh, to uh, just uh, rise and um, identify yourself briefly, and then please feel free to ask uh, uh, anything about a talk. Yes.
and the second one is uh, maybe I'll leave it to the CRDC. My question to you is, uh, so far, we don't have much from um, that name, political party, that no new media policy. The CRDC has new media exception, driving their feet, and uh, so What's a new media exception? Uh, well, the CRDC has decided that uh, uh, there's no regulation there in the new media as far as talking about that. So we were sending that a couple of years ago under review and then dragging the feet. So my question to you is in the state, the uh, they decided that the FCC, it's the only interpretation they could forward this word, uh, would be kind of a put down and the forces in the market would decide how the, the environment, the telecom environment, and the new environment would work. Let's talk about Canada now. How do you think this is going to scale in Canada? Do you mean, do, you th do I think that Canadians will adopt an attitude of letting the market decide how this will develop? Uh, that could be an influence coming from the South, yeah, certainly. I would, I have no idea. I would like to hear from people here. Okay. Uh, well, I really am not familiar with your regulatory environment long well enough to comment on it authoritatively. You do have people here who do know this and know this. I know that Catherine Murray does. Well, so I would love to hear from you about what you think are the, the regulatory opportunities and obstacles. Well, uh, uh, Jean, uh, Jean, uh, um, the 1999 decision of the CRTC to actually uh, withhold from regulating new media is up for review now. And uh, it is going to be extremely interesting how. Um, the commission will find its mandate because there will be a new appointment for the chair of the commission. And at the same time, there is current pressure on the existing Minister of Canadian Heritage to have a review of the future of the regulator. As you know, the biggest pressure is coming from the telecommunications side to uh, completely deregulate and to actually change Canada's laws with respect to foreign investment. So there are large challenges, and uh, our very own TELUS here in British Columbia is one of the ones who is pressing pretty extensively for uh, a lighter regulatory touch uh, at the CRTC, and is also pushing very much for uh, aggressive entry of the telephone carriers into video um, downloading um, as a new lucrative sector of their potential industry. So I would say that there is a, a state of regulatory flux, but there's very low level of knowledge about what is on the regulatory agenda, and the political opportunity structure is very hard to read right now for citizens interested in mobilizing on this issue. Uh, would anyone else like to, to yes, right, right, yes sir, yes. Yeah. Uh, my name is John Hudson. Um, you touched a couple of times on uh, identity, and you indicated that the very rapidly growing ecosystem, if you will, of uh, uh, social software leads to something that might be called, you know, public. Something. I won't call it public broadcast, let's call it public media. Um, <coughs> Public media, I believe, I don't know much about it in the United States, but in Canada, was created for some purposes in a context at a given time. Uh, I believe as well in places like England, where it's known sometimes, I think, as Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition, um, and in France. What would you see as the role of public media over and above something amorphous called identity in a globalized, multicultural, highly diverse uh, world or 